Hello, Bible readers. This is my 19th post about Revelation, and you know how they say that sometimes you don't know what you don't know? Well, that's been true for me thus far. All kinds of stuff in this study has left me going, oh, but today's post is all about the stuff I knew I didn't know. Chapters 12 to 14 have all the most famous images of evil, a dragon, a sea beast, a land beast that marks its people with that infamous number 666. What could it all mean and what does it definitely not mean? So I try to say it in every post to give credit to the primary sources I'm using because I, I want to make it clear I am not clever enough to know all this stuff myself. I am leaning hard on Craig Kester, a professor at Luther Seminary, Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza's commentary called Revelation, Vision of a Just World, Reverend Dr. Barbara Rossing's The Rapture Exposed, and most of all, Dr. M. Eugene Boring's commentary on Revelation for the Interpretation series. And I want to make sure to mention all those sources because this might be a, po a post worth reposting. And there's so much to say that I think I'm going to need to break this into, I think, three posts. Let's see how it goes. First of all, chapters 12 to 14, like chapters 1 to 3, like chapters 6 through 8, 1, and then 8, 2 to 11, chapters 12 to 14 are a unit. One of the things that's always frustrated me about trying to read Revelation was that I never understood the structure of the letter. I certainly didn't know the context very well either, for sure, but just the actual following along, like, so I just read about seven seals and all those calamities, and then there's seven trumpets? Are they new plagues and disasters? I wasn't sure what to make of it all. So Revelation, I'm learning, isn't written in some kind of sequential order, right? I'm so unfamiliar with the apocalypse genre that I just didn't get what would have been a given to people who heard the letter read 1900 years ago and be like, oh yeah, here's how this goes. And yeah, they, they could, they'd know what to do with it all. In previous posts, I've talked about how we've been brought to the end twice now. In chapter 11, verses 15 to 19, all that is supposed to happen at the end of an apocalypse happens. God comes, the dead are raised, the good are rewarded, there's a sense of restoration and fulfillment. Yay, right? Chronologically, Revelation has nowhere more to go. We've been through the final plagues twice and have now come to the end again. The letter could be done here. Even the first hearers of this letter may have thought, okay, time to, you know, put our jackets on and get ready to go, but wait. There's more. These three chapters I'm looking at today are not a continuation of the visions we've already heard about. They're not some kind of conclusion either. I've described two interludes previously, each coming after the sixth seal and the sixth trumpet, right? Interludes that were each about the church in John's time. First, the church militant and triumphant, and then the church as prophet and martyr. But these three chapters, 12 to 14, they're not that either. They're not an interlude. Boring says, and this is an extended quote because I can't say it any better, the series of visions here in 12 to 14 is the central axis of the book and the core of its pictorial argument. We experience something of a surrealistic flashback and flash forward through the events that have just been pictured in the visions of the seven seals and the seven trumpets. Going back to the time of the pre-creation world of God's eternity and then forward again to the end and beyond. A verbal and visual Sistine Chapel panorama. And the word panorama literally means a vision of everything. In John's view, Boring says, the Christians of Asia need to keep the decisions they make in perspective. And John provides that perspective. From the perspective of eternity, John will return once more to his pattern of a final series of seven plagues before the end, only this time he will indeed mean the last. 
So after chapters 12 to 14, there's going to be one more series of seven plagues before the end, and then there will be the end. So that helps me understand the structure of this letter. Like without that explanation, I feel like I, I have my hand in a box. Have you ever done this before? You're supposed to figure out, you know, oh, what's in there? Is it, is it noodles or is it brains? You know, grapes or eyeballs? Okay, I did this at a Halloween party as a child. But anyway, I appreciate being told explicitly how John is structuring his letter. Okay, so now the next thing that's going to help us understand these chapters is to learn a bit about the images John chooses. And I'm going to be saying quite a bit about these images. So before I get into those images, I want, I want you to understand where these images are coming from and how that doesn't need to be a problem. Every culture has myths shape the ways that culture processes life and death and the world and what is in that world. Myth doesn't have to always mean fake or fairy tale. Myth busting, for example, is about explaining away a false idea. The kind of myth I'm talking about is a story, a story that attempts to explain the unexplainable, like Adam and Eve. This is not a scientific explanation of the origins of humanity. The flood and Noah's Ark and the rainbow symbolizing God's promise, like people of faith do not need these biblical myths to have literally happened in order for humans to be the apple of God's eye in truth, in order for God to be God, to be a God of promises, kept promises. Like, myth is simply a storytelling device that gives shape to our hope and our faith and the ways we relate to each other, more than giving shape to just like our intellect or our knowledge. Myth is not just trying to feed our intellect or our knowledge. An American myth, for example, is that our nation was founded so that every person has the freedom to pursue life and liberty and happiness, right? That story is a device. It's a story Americans tell themselves. It's a device that gives shape to a shared American dream, our hope. And it shapes the ways we relate to each other. Like everybody's got uh, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, it does not shape, that story, does not shape our knowledge as though the United States has always actually been a place where all people have had equal opportunity to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Some, I, those words were written by an enslaver at a time when the nation's economy depended on enslaved people. Knowing better, we could say, well, that's a myth. And we've busted it. It's not true. But myth can be so much more than a claim that's true or false. It can be a story that a community or a nation uses to process their lives and have some agreed upon values and some agreed upon terms and hopes. And I say all that because John's church community, like our community, like every other community, they lived with many myths in their lives. Like my Stanton family, my maternal Torberg family. They each have myths of their own that tell the generations who we are and who we strive to be. My nation has myths. My Christian denomination has myths, mostly wrapped up in Martin Luther and his exploits from the 16th century. My football team, the Green Bay Packers, lives on myth as much as any sports team in the world. So I live with lots of these stories stories. And many of the stories, the myths, many of them overlap or they echo off of each other. For example, Lutherans believe in the priesthood of all believers. Put simply, that means no clergy person is any closer to God or more important to the community of God than any lay person. We're all in this together. We all have different gifts the community needs. Well, that idea that God's grace and love and power are shared? The Green Bay Packers have no single owner. They make a big deal out of that, that they are the only professional sports team in North America to not have one owner. 
there's a, a similar value being appreciated there, right? The lack of hierarchy, priesthood of all believers, no owner. So I'm going deep into the idea of myth here because I want you to understand that the way John borrows from other myths of his region and of his time, the ways he alludes to other characters and images and belief systems, it doesn't need to trouble us. I've heard people over the years ask about, well, you know, pastor, the Jesus story sounds a lot like the Greek or the Roman or whatever ancient Near East myth they want to reference. And then because there are so many similarities, they're troubled. What Professor Boring and I would both say to this is that there's no need to be troubled. John is simply using images and pictures that would have had some familiarities from some other myths in order to say something very unique. Namely, that God is revealed through the slaughtered lambikins. No other ancient Near East myth does that. John's reimagining of these images and pictures is what is new. So not far from Patmos, where John is stuck, was the island of Delos, sacred to the Greeks because that's where Apollo was said to have been born. Apollo, if you don't remember your Greek mythology, is son of Zeus and Leto. Leto, that's a she, fled to the island Delos to escape a dragon called Python. Boring says this basic outline of this mythological plot is common to many peoples. It's a variation of a story where the forces of darkness rebel against the forces of light, attempting to overthrow God's order, kill the newborn king, and establish a rule of darkness. In the Greek's story, the dragon Python wants to kill Apollo, kind of like Herod wants to kill Jesus, right? This sounds familiar, but Apollo instead kills the dragon. So Roman emperors put their own twist on this myth. Their goddess Roma was the queen of heaven. Her son is the emperor, of course. See, heaven and earth meet in Rome. The emperor is responsible for killing the dragon, and the dragon is understood to be anything that opposes the goodness of life. Of course, that would only be determined by the emperor. So the emperor keeps founding a new golden age, more and more golden with each successive emperor. Read these chapters 12 to 14, and you're going to see how obvious the echoes of this Greek and Roman and more myth are. Again, that doesn't need to trouble us. John is just making, John is just good at making use of his own time's myths so that the most common sense listener can catch on to the good news about this new idea that the slaughtered lamikins is the one who conquers. So with my next post, I'm going to say more about the characters of this story. The woman, the Messiah, Christians, the earth itself, Michael and the angels, God is the hidden actor, and the evil trinity. Once I get through the cast of characters in this unit, I'm going to get to the actual plot. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places.